Hi guys, it is January 10th and I'm on the same trail as I was last week, only a different corner. And I've got my tea and I'm sitting on my little isolating pad. And I thought it would only be appropriate if I brought you out here with me today and talk to you again about my books that I talked about last week that I was going to begin my reading year with or be fiction at least, because I still haven't made any real progress with a non-fiction. Um, but I already told you last week that I didn't really gel with Rosamund Pilcher's writing style and I haven't picked up Winter Solstice since. It initially looked like I would get on better with Benjamin Myers' The Offing, which I had picked instead to ring in the new year. Um, to recap, this is the story of a young man, a 16-year-old man, boy, from County Durham, who isn't very keen on following in his father's and grandfather's footsteps and becoming a coal miner. So he goes on a long hike, like it's kind of his last goodbye to the sun, so to speak. And he takes on jobs on farms and he lives off the land and sleeps rough. And after a few weeks of this, he ends up staying for some time with an elderly lady who lives very isolated in the country. Sorry, this is a rough cut, but suddenly a whole lot of people came to my little corner, several groups. And one of them told me that two packs of wolves have been living in the vicinity for a while now so this might be the last that anybody ever sees of me but anyway back to the book um where was i um the protagonist of the offing stays with the elderly lady for a while who is very isolated and lives off the land as well, but she also has uh, several friends who provide her with all kinds of rich food, um, seafood and exotic food like, like lemons, for instance, which um, did I mention that the book takes place in the aftermath of World War II? So um, fresh food and lemons in particular are usually very hard to come by and it is kind of the young man's initiation into such things as good food and slow living if you want to call it that and she also initiates him into poetry and i think some light philosophy and with that she obviously made quite an impression and sent him on a trajectory of becoming a lover of poetry and fine arts it seems because the book is told from the perspective of his older self in first person narration and he is obviously the, the older him is obviously an extremely poetical and lyrical man this might all sound quite positive but unfortunately i didn't think that there was very much behind all that to me it seemed just like it seemed very self-indulgent and pornographic. It was just a whole lot of food porn and scenery porn and then poetry porn. And with a with a poetry porn, we also, I think, crossed a border into pretentiousness territory. So unfortunately, I have to report that I stopped reading the book after a bit more than the first third i think and i can't even show you the book anymore so i'll insert a picture because not just did i not take it with me on this trip but i've already taken it to the little free library that's how little i liked it unfortunately hello again and good news guys guess what i haven't been eaten Fortunately for you, because otherwise you'd never know what other books I didn't like. <laughs> so I have two more books to talk about today, two more books I took on this little trip with me. And one of them I actually started in the middle of December. I read a little bit in it and then put it down and only picked it up again today. And it's turned out to be weirdly appropriate. 
Ta-da! It's White Fang by Jack London, the story of the friendship between a feral wolfhound and a young man in Alaska. The movie adaptation with Ethan Hawke was one of my favorite movies when I was a child and I was recently reminded of the existence of this book and I found a used copy so I bought it. And it's a bit of a weird reading experience. The beginning doesn't read like a children's book at all. If I remember correctly, it's the same beginning as in the movie version, where a pack of wolves tracks a sleigh over several days through the Alaskan wilderness and picks off the dogs one by one and in the end even one of the two men and only the one survives. But now in the second chapter or the second part of the book we are suddenly experiencing life from the point of view of the wolfhound and it's surprisingly little anthropomorphizing but it's still somewhat cheesy and if I didn't know that this was a children's book and Jack London probably wrote this to teach children the habits of wild wolves I I don't know if I wouldn't put it down again immediately but since I do know that this is a children's book I'm a little bit more accepting of things like that what does get on my nerves though is that there's an awful lot of pathos in the writing style. Still a nice nostalgic reading experience for me. And then I have one more book. This is a short story collection by Carlos Fuentes. Carlos Fuentes was one of the four writers that formed the exclusive inner circle of the writers that brought about the so-called boom of Latin American literature. The other three were Cortaza, Garcia Marquez and um, the, the, um, the only surviving one, um, Vargas Llosa. Carlos Fuentes is the only one of these four that I hadn't read anything by until this morning. So far I've read one short story and I'm a little bit disappointed, I have to say. It was disappointingly mundane. I, I think it just hasn't aged well. It was written in the 70s, I think, and it is about the conflict of generations between the liberal youth and the bourgeois older generation. And the problem is that nothing really happens, <laughs> in, uh, that, that there isn't really any plot in the story. It's just parents talking to children and obviously living on another plane of existence and this isn't exactly newsworthy or short story worthy nowadays i'd say i'm hoping that the rest of the stories in here will be a little bit weirder maybe i i had been hoping for a weirdness level that comes close to the short stories of cortaza but that was maybe a little bit too optimistic my battery is about to die on me, I'm afraid, so I'm saying goodbye for now and I talk to you again in a couple of days about some other things that I will have been reading. Bye guys! Hello again, the rest of this little not quite vlog is going to be a lot more cozy but also with a lot worse lighting I'm afraid but that's the price we pay. So it is Tuesday January 12th and I'm afraid I have to report that I spoke much too soon with what I said about the anthropomorphization in 
uh, white fang because it turns out that there is a whole lot of that going on. So the book has a much broader focus than the movie. The movie is all about, like I said, the, this great friendship between the wolf dog and the young prospector from Klondike. But the book's focus is much broader and it, it tells the whole life story of White Fang from even before he was conceived. It tells of his childhood or puppyhood I guess or cupwood um, he is one quarter dog three quarters wolf and the book tells us all about how a wolf a young wolf grows up in the wild and white fang has the misfortune to fall into the hands of a band of humans who are not very good to him and he ends up being sold to a dog fighting ring and there, of course, his life is miserable. Not only does he have to fight and kill dogs every night, but he also gets abused and neglected by the humans. But in the end, he is rescued by the young prospector whose love and kindness turns him from a vicious animal into man's best friend. It is a bit reminiscent of Anna Sewell's Black Beauty. I don't even know which one of these books came first. But anyway, they are very different in how the central animal character is portrayed and is used. White Fang is all about how the good treatment that he gets in the end brings about this transformation and sublimation of his character and how he gets to fulfill his true potential once he gets the right treatment. Jack London seems to have had an agenda against animal cruelty but in his attempts to make his exemplary wolf character sympathetic he portrays him like a human being. The trouble is that the omniscient narrator in this book, who narrates a lot from the perspective of White Fang himself, when he tells us White Fang's experiences, he doesn't differentiate carefully between just more or less neutrally relating these experiences or observations and rationalizing them in a human way and using human concepts. For instance, when White Fang comes across human beings for the first time, it is established that he thinks of them as gods. It's never expressly stated that, of course, he doesn't know the concept, which perhaps Jack London should have done because he's writing for children after all. Mm, but I can let that slide. However, from that point onwards, even when events are narrated from the perspective of Wild Fang and he is just observing events, the word God is used for humans, like the door opened and the big white God stepped out. The God's voice was harsh and Wild Fang did not like it. And the transformation of Wild Fang's character is also framed in such a human way. My favorite sentence in the whole book was, Wild Fang was in the process of finding himself, establishing his identity as a wolf dog, I guess. And it all just seemed so unself-aware and I got the impression that Jack London wasn't exactly the greatest of thinkers. And while he may have had noble intentions in writing this book, I think from a literary standpoint, it's just simply atrocious. So I needed a, a new fiction book that would hopefully hook me and I picked The Spy Who Came In From The Cold by John Le Carré. This is my first John Le Carré. It's a Cold War spy thriller written in the 60s. John Le Carré wrote serious spy thrillers which often have quite a gloomy atmosphere and in which the main character 
is often conflicted about the righteousness of his governments or his agencies, policies and modes of operation and about the place and the function that he himself has in the machine. And to be honest, this is the only sort of spy fiction that I'm interested in. I have no interest whatsoever in your usual odes to nationalism that spy, uh, fun spy thrillers usually are. However, this might be a little too little fun for me. The protagonist here is an agent who is stationed or, or used to be stationed in West Berlin with contacts across the border in East Berlin and Eastern Germany. But a Soviet counter agent has been killing off all these agents and contacts in, in Eastern Germany. And now the protagonist Alec Limas is going to be sent in for a final act of retribution and to kill off the one who's been killing these agents. But so far his mission hasn't really started yet. I'm on page 70, no, 57 and his bosses have told Limas, the protagonist, to lie low for a while and to create the impression that he's been fired from the service or retired. And in order to make it seem extremely authentic, Limas has actually become an alcoholic. He even went to prison for a while and seemingly has lost control of his life. Yet somehow that has made him a chick magnet. And that's all very tedious, not to mention implausible that he should meet what seems to be the insta love of his life when he is in this condition. And the style of narration is very sparse and we never get, or at least up until this point, we haven't gotten a lot of insight into his character or any of the others. So, I was left to wonder how that even came about. They they worked together for a few days. I think they shared one lunch break and suddenly the woman was in love with him. And he seems to like her too, but there was never any lead up to this. So it came really out of the blue and it's implausible, but also leaves you quite indifferent to the whole Roman storyline. Because if you can't really see the characters' feelings for each other or feel their feelings for each other, then why should you feel anything other than indifference towards them? So this was quite a letdown. I was so excited to finally read my first Le Carré, but I think I'm just going to skim read this one and then jump to either Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy or to Our Kind of Traitor, which is a relatively recent release. It came out in 2010. And I can only hope that John le Carré changed dramatically over the course of his career, because those aren't even the only other books of his that I own. <laughs> but fortunately, I'm a little more successful this reading year on the nonfiction side, and I'm enjoying Feet in the Clouds very much. This is the history of fell running. And in this book, the author not only gives us the history of fell running and introduces us to big names in the field, famous athletes, but they are all non-professionals, by the way, they do this as a passion in their spare time, or almost all of them. And not only that, but he is also a fell runner himself, and the book is full of anecdotes, which are always nicely self-deprecating and the author often exaggerates a lot about the calamities that befell him on the mountains, which is very funny to read. Um, he might not be the wittiest of writers and stylists, but I can't forgive that because I, I enjoy the content so much. I'm not sure if this book would be as enjoyable for somebody 
who doesn't already come to it with an interest in fell running or with a love of the mountains and the UK mountains in particular. But I, for my part, I'm enjoy am enjoying this very much and I'm having fun revisiting some of the places that Richard Asquith talks about. And the next thing that you will hear from me will be a little emergency book haul, which will still be part of this video, I think, because it's only very little and I'd like to end this video on a somewhat more positive note. For now, I'm going to drown my sorrows in hot chocolate from my Scotty Dog mug. Nice bit of accidental coordination there. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a nice night. So you've already seen a major spoiler in the clips that I filmed on my way to and from the bookshop this afternoon. Since I've had such bad luck with my choices lately, I decided that I'd go with some modern classics, working under the assumption that you can't go entirely wrong with those. Now, normally I would look for classics and modern classics in online used bookshops first, but I wanted to support my local bookshops who are still allowed to do curbside pickup. And classics are among the books that they can usually procure overnight, even though they are English. So I finally bought myself a copy of Catch-22. And this novel was released in 1961, but it is a novel about the Second World War, or rather, it is a novel about the absurdity and sad and tragic ridiculousness of war. And in the story, a group of soldiers who are stationed on a US Air Force base in the Mediterranean Sea are trying to survive the last month of the Second World War. I feel like this is a really dramatic gap in my education since Catch-22 has become an expression that has entered um, the general dictionary. So I should really have read the book that, that, that made it popular, I think. And the second modern classic that I bought is A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. This is a story about a dystopian future in which the law of the street rules and the law of the street is ultra violence. This is supposed to be a book in which you find yourself maybe not exactly rooting for the protagonist, but definitely feeling for the protagonist and kind of sympathizing with him despite yourself, even though rationally you know that what he is doing and thinking is abominable, kind of like Lolita in a way. I've only read one other book by Anthony Burgess so far, and that was A Dead Man in Bedford, which was one of my absolute favorite books of 2019. Um, it is a story about the life of Christopher Marlowe told from the perspective of a contemporary and framed as if it is a novel that was written in Elizabethan times.
It is a linguistic masterpiece and inventive language is also a thing in A Clockwork Orange. So, and this is something that I really like, so I'm really counting on this one. I initially meant to read um, uh, Anthony Burgess's Shakespeare book first, uh, which is called Nothing Like the Sun, but then I figured that maybe it is a little bit too close to a dead man in Bedford in subject matter and will probably only disappoint me <laughs> because I don't like it as much. So then I thought, why not this one? It's Unfortunately, his most famous work, I think that A Dead Man in Deadford should be more famous, but oh well. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very short book, so I might even pick it up. <laughs> and then I have two crime novels that are comparatively recent releases, and they have both been adapted for the screen. The first one is Defending Jacob by William Lenday. And this is the, a, um, a legal thriller and or courtroom drama and it is about a district attorney or somebody working in the district attorney's office um, who is investigating or prosecuting the um, in the case of a, a a brutal murder of a young boy 12 years old maybe even younger and in the course of the investigations the attorney's own son who is the same age as the murdered boy and in fact is his classmate his son falls under suspicion of being the murderer and i think this is the movie tie-in but i'm not really sure if you've watched the film or TV adaptation, please do let me know what you thought of it. But no spoilers, please. And finally, I have a Spanish novel, which was surprisingly easy to get a hold of, and it was comparatively inexpensive. And when I say comparatively, I mean it was only 16 euros for a mass market paperback. Spanish books are crazily expensive and weirdly hard to get here. I don't know what this is all about, but it was a comparatively easy with this one because it is rather famous because its screen adaptation has been very successful. It might even be, if not a Netflix production, then available on Netflix, but I'm not sure. I'll look it up. Um, and the book is... El Silencio de la Ciudad Blanca by Eva Sainz and it is set in Vitoria which is the capital of the Basque country something different for a change and apparently it is full of Basque history and lore and even folklore the story is that a serial killer seems to be murdering again or at least murders are occurring that bear a striking resemblance to the killings of this serial killer who has however been in prison for quite some time that's all i know so far it sounds like that crime novel that was set in scotland which i talked about in my most recent yes in my most recent video um a Litter of Bones by J.D. Kirk, which I found frustrating because I thought that there wasn't enough exploration of the psychological implications of a situation like that, which must be so horrible for the police officers who are involved. I have a small request. If you are a Spanish speaker, or if you can read Spanish, please do go to the Goodreads page and read the first sentence of the synopsis of this book and then tell me if it reminds you of something or if it's just me. So these are the four books that I bought this week with which I hope my fortune will turn. I'm going to snuggle up with my unicorn now and try to pick the book with which I'm going to start this new era of my reading life. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. I think I'm going to try and do 
more vlogs in the future um, but in the future i'm going to include more hopefully interesting scenes and less of just me talking thank you for sticking with me for this long <laughs> so far bye